this talk is about um, uh, root server abuse, sort of a follow-on to a talk I gave last year. Um, in, I'm doing this work with, uh, in conjunction with CADA, and we're still interested in understanding why the root servers uh, are getting slammed so much. And um, unlike the previous uh, study, which where we analyzed uh, traffic, this one um, is a simulation, a lab simulation of various name servers, uh, caching name servers. So we're interested in seeing are any particular name server implementations uh, worse than others? Are they more abusive? Uh, are they distributing the load uh, as we would expect them to? <clears throat> and here's a, a, a cartoon of the test network that I used. There's basically five boxes. Uh, one box handles uh, root server queries, one handles top level domains, and one handles second level domains, and actually anything um, beyond that, third level, fourth level, etc. cetera. Um, there's a, a simulated wide area network with packet loss and delays. Um, this guy is the, the caching name server where uh, this is the, the part that we're interested in testing. And there's a, a box that just submits a whole bunch of queries, as a user might. The workload is taken from um, web proxy logs, about 12 hours worth. There were uh, 5.5 million total DNS queries with 107,000 unique host names, 70,000 unique uh, second level domains. 431 top-level domains, uh, many of which are um, invalid, and only one root. I made up a bunch of uh, zone files, and the, the contents of those zone files are uh, sort of based on reality. For the, for the root and top-level domains, uh, it uses the actual zone data for <clears throat> the number of name servers, the, um, and the TTLs on the name server and uh, glue records. For the um, second level domain, since there were so many of them, it's you know, impossible to have the actual values there. So I took a sample of, of real data and then used that sample to um, generate random values. Again, um, here are the, it, trying to mimic the number of address records per name and the TTLs on address, name server, and uh, CNAME records. One thing that's a little different than reality is each second level domain has just two name servers. And um, this, this last measurement is 35% probability that any name is a CNAME record was actually based on actual measurements as well. Here's a sample zone file. I don't expect you to be able to read this, at least not on the screens. If you're really interested, you can look at the slides. Um, but this shows um, some samples from, from my simulated.org zone. Um, this is before the uh, move to um, the Anycast servers. So there was something like eight or nine uh, different name servers. And uh, on the right side, you see some sample um, zones, some second level zones under there. <clears throat> this is a list of the caching software um, that I tested. Uh, two versions of bind, bind 8 and bind 9, uh, DJB DNS, and two versions of Windows. Um, this, these different um, software packages run only on the, on the, the caching name server box. The top level domain, second level, and uh, the roots all run bind 8. I did six different test configurations. Um, the simplest one has no delays and no packet loss. Um, then I did one with uh, constant 100 millisecond delays and no packet loss. Um, I have three with linear delays, which I'll uh, explain in the next slide what that's about. Uh, one with no packet loss, 5% packet loss, and 25% packet loss. And finally, uh, one with 100% packet loss. Here's how the uh, linear delays were configured. Um, on the first name server, it was 40 milliseconds delay and increased by uh, 10 milliseconds for every name server after that. So um, the, the 13th name server in, in cases where there were 13 name servers had 160 millisecond delays. So here's a few results. Um, this graph shows 
total number of queries sent by each um, tested configuration, each, each version of the software for the case of no delays and no packet loss. <clears throat> the blue represents um, queries sent to the roots, the green is queries sent to the top level domains, and the red is queries to the second level domain name servers. And you can see that um, bind eight has the most queries with just over one million total for this 12 hour period. And then, um, then they sort of go down from there. One of the things that's sort of striking about this is bind nine sends uh, quite a bit more queries to the roots than any, any of the others, although uh, DJBDNS is um, similar. And there's a few numbers down there just to show you, um, just to give you an idea. <clears throat> and here's another result um, of a sort of a more realistic case with linear base delays and 5% packet loss. And the numbers are about the same. Um, in most cases, they're, they just went up a little bit uh, due to the, the delays and the loss. So bind eight sends a lot of queries, and um, here are some of the reasons why. At least on, in, in my test where um, I had IPv6 on the box, uh, it sends both quad A and A6 queries to all of the name servers, the roots, the second level and top level domains for any name server address that has expired. Um, and bind eight and actually all of the other software except for bind nine uh, do what I call they forward cache misses for uh, pending hits or they, they forward misses for um, repeated queries. And here's, here's sort of an example of that, um, a TCP dump output where there's two queries right in a row for the same name. And um, if you spent the time to follow this through, you would see that um, the bind nine caching name server sends uh, four queries all the way through, through the roots, the second level domains, um, until it gets the first answer back. So in the case where you have a, a, a high rate of queries for a single uh, a name, you can get a lot of um, queries, per, perhaps an uh, unnecessary amount of queries. <clears throat> um, Bind9 is the only uh, software that is sort of smart enough to realize that it's expecting a reply for this uh, name any, any, any second now, and it postpones uh, later queries until that reply comes back. <clears throat> but um, on the other hand, Bind9 still sends a lot of queries to the roots, and um, one of the reasons is that it sends A and A6 queries for um, both expired uh, name server records starting at the root. So when the cached glue record expires, it doesn't start at the um, top level domain. It starts back at the root, perhaps because it doesn't trust um, the, the cached data for the top level domain. And um, below there's, there's sort of a real world, real world example where this might be um, excessive. Uh, Microsoft is a relatively popular site. They have four um, NS records, four glue records with relatively low TTLs. So every time one of those glue records expires, a uh, bind nine caching name server is gonna send eight queries uh, to the roots. <clears throat> and uh, DJBDNS is similar. It uh, requeries the roots for the expired glue records, um, but only for one of the name servers. It doesn't um, query both, unless I suppose the first one uh, doesn't come back. And it only sends uh, IPv4 address queries. Um, one of the things that's unique about this software is that it, if it gets a, um, an additional record in a reply that is a, a glue record with an IP address that has a TTL zero, it, um, it is, thinks there's something fishy about that and starts back at the roots um, to get that name server's IP address. And here's an example of that. The first line shows the user's query. The second line shows um, <clears throat> 
um, shows the caching name server asking for this um, address at the top level domain, the answer comes back and there's an, a, a glue record with a zero TTL which you can't really see. But in the fourth line there, you can see that it um, goes to the roots um, for ns0.quijibo.com and so on. <clears throat> Here's uh, all of the results for bind eight except for the 100% um, the loss test which I'll show separately. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is as the sort of network conditions get harsher, um, bind nine or bind eight sends slightly fewer queries. It, I don't know if you can tell, but the, the graphs go down a little bit, um, especially for the um, the 100 percent millisecond or 100 millisecond delays. There's quite a drop uh, to the top level domain queries there. Here's um, the same thing for bind nine. And one of the things that's interesting to note here is that the number of queries is unaffected by uh, network delays, but only by loss. So for the first three uh, cases, the, the total number of queries is just about the same, just about equal. Uh, <clears throat> the results for DJB DNS, um, nothing, nothing really obvious to comment on here. Here's uh, Windows 2000 and Windows 2003. Um, this graph I find particularly interesting, however. This is the, the tests with 100% packet loss. So this is what happens when a caching name server can um, send queries out to the roots, but for some reason those responses aren't, aren't getting back. Um, <clears throat> and there's quite a, quite a lot of difference here between the, the different software and how they behave. Um, bind 9 is uh, obviously lower than any others. And remember from the workload slide that um, this workload has 5 million total DNS queries. So in the case of bind 8, it ends up sending about 38 million uh, queries out to the roots for those 5 million original queries. And obviously Windows 2000 is even worse with something like 65 million. <clears throat> and here's, a, here's another way of looking at the same data. These are uh, traces of the query rates for all of the different uh, configurations. The black line shows queries generated by the user. And um, as you can see, all of the software except for bind nine actually amplifies the query rates. Um, I don't have the data shown here, but due to some other tests that I was running, um, at, a, at a higher query rate, some of these, some of the software would actually throttle itself. Um, you can't see that here, but uh, I think Windows 2000 did not, and bind eight and nine, or uh, DJB DNS and bind eight actually did throttle themselves at some higher level, say, you know, 2,000 queries per second was their limit. <clears throat> um, I have a little bit of data now on the way that these different caching name servers distributed the load to um, the roots and, and one of the top level domains. So the, the common uh, perception is that the name servers pick the best one based on measurements that they perform. They know uh, the network conditions, they know the round trip times and so on. <clears throat> here's, here's an example of, of how this data looks. There's, um, there's two data sets shown here. The, the red shows queries sent to the roots and the green shows queries sent to the uh, .com TLDs. The x-axis has uh, the 13 um, name servers for each one. And the, the two y-axis show the counts, although that's um, sort of not, not critical here. <clears throat> this is uh, for bind eight, and in the case where there's no packet loss and no delays, bind eight just latches on to one particular name server and keeps using it. There's no reason for it to switch. Um, the rest of this there's, look pretty reasonable. There's something funny going on, however, with the 100% um, packet loss 
case where it, it hits some root servers a little bit harder than others, uh, twice as much it looks like. But for the, the cases with the linear delays, it looks reasonable, sort of what we would expect. Remember that the, the in all these, the, um, the first name server, the A, has the lowest um, latency and the M name server has the highest. Here's bind eight. Um, for the no packet loss, no delay case, it's much more even. It's round robin essentially querying all name servers equally. <clears throat> and the same for the, uh, the other two cases there at the top. And a nice um, exponential distribution for all the linear delay cases. Uh, DJB DNS uh, always does essentially round robin distribution to the name servers regardless of um, packet loss or delays. And that's not no surprise. They um, they mention that in, in the uh, software description. <clears throat> this is Windows 2000, and um, the surprising thing here is for the cases with linear delays, it, it seems to ignore any actual measurements at all, I guess. Um, it always picks one name, essentially always picks one name server and just sticks with it. And additionally, for the, um, for the .com name servers, it always ends up picking A and uh, sends all of its queries to that. For the roots, it's, it's a little more uh, random. This, this may be an artifact of, of the, the way my test was set up, I'm not sure. Um, or it may just be that um, the way Windows 2000 works. For the 100% packet loss case, it's interesting that um, there's some green lines there which probably shouldn't be there. It, the x-axis shows just one, so it sent one query to the uh, top level domains for, um, for a few cases, but that's sort of an anomaly. And here's um, the current version of Windows 2003. And uh, it's a little bit better. Um, still some funny things going on uh, with the 100% packet loss case where some root name servers get hit a lot more than others. And in the linear delay cases, it's not quite as uh, smooth or not, not quite the distribution I would expect to see, but at least it is um, distributed a little bit. <clears throat> so now I have to say a few things about um, this. This quote is is from Slashdot, based on the talk that I gave last year or the uh, paper that was presented last year, where I mentioned that two percent of only two percent of the queries hitting the roots are um, valid, basically. And uh, here's the punchline from last year's talk. These are the nine or so categories that I came up with. And um, I told you that, you know, there's a lot of repeats, there was a lot of unknown top level domains, et cetera, but the legitimate category only got about 2%. <clears throat> so I, I took the, the uh, results from, from this study, my, my simulations, and ran it through the software from last year's study. And uh, here are some of those numbers. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I didn't see that all of my uh, tra all of my queries were legitimate. Uh, not surprisingly, there, I I would expect to see this unknown TLD category, but I was a little bit disappointed to see so many repeated queries show up here. And the uh, referral not cached category has a little bit too high of uh, percentages. <clears throat> so the the explanation is that in last year's talk, I was not really aware that software like Bind9 and DJB DNS um, start over at the roots for certain cases for expired name server records and um, you know zero TTL uh, glue records. So if I exclude those um, queries from the result and run it again, this sort of shows uh, some of the <clears throat> some of the numbers. It's, it's better, but it's still not um, perfect. Another explanation may be that the, um, in last year's study, I assumed that all of the top-level domains uh, and the roots had um, TTLs longer than the, the time of the test, so longer than 24 hours. 
And in running these tests, that's certainly not the case. There certainly are top-level domains with TTLs um, shorter than 24 hours. But I'm still not sure that it's just as simple as that. So this perhaps means that um, that number of 2% is higher and that the case where um, this referral not cashed category, which is about 4%, those may actually have been legitimate uh, queries. And some of the repeated queries may have been legitimate also. Um, so I have just a couple of conclusion slides left here. Um, bind 8, uh, as we've seen, can, can sort of latch on to a single name server in, in a low latency, low loss condition. And unfortunately, I didn't run more tests and find what those thresholds were. There, there must be some threshold where you know, it's decided something's um, not quite right and it starts to distribute the load a little bit, but I don't have those numbers. Um, DJB uses uniform distribution in all cases, um, ignoring TTLs, or ignoring round trip times <clears throat> and packet loss. Um, Windows 2000 DNS server is, is, has a really, really bad server selection algorithm as far as I can tell. Um, and the 2003 algorithm is maybe a little bit better, but I think it'd still be improved. Um, it seems to me that the fact that bind 8 at least and uh, bind 9 also sends queries to the roots for IPv6 addresses may be causing a little bit of abuse. Um, I really love the fact that bind 9 does not um, forward cache misses for pending hits. I think that's uh, a very nice thing. <clears throat> and another thing I like about by 9 is that it um, attenuates the, the, uh, the load in the case where it's not communicating well with uh, the root name server. It doesn't send more queries than the user sends. It sends fewer. Uh, and finally, as, as I uh, admitted, we need to Im I need to improve the models for uh, analyzing um, traces, real traces from uh, real root servers and so on to uh, see if we can figure out how many queries are legitimate and how many are bogus. That's it. Thank you. You, uh, you didn't go as long as I thought you did. Any questions from the assembled multitude? To, for Dwayne, okay, I got one. For, I've got one for you. Are you as you try and cre um, refine your technique? Are you going to try and refine your test bed to more accurate, accurately reflect <coughs> DNS deployed DNS infrastructure, or are you going to just work on the modeling and the software? You mean, for example, not assuming that delays are linear across name servers and so on, like that? Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, I would, I would, um, I think that's an important next step. Um, it, but it's obviously difficult because, um, you know, the, just the, the round, the round trip time distribution depends on where you are and who you are and, and that sort of thing, I guess. That, and, yeah, that's and, part of it. Um, difficult with all the anycast name servers out there and so on. That, that's actually sort of intriguing because if you actually put an anycast instance into play in your test bed, it would be, Part, part of the problems with, with managing any cast instances is how, how do you actually moni you know, monitor them and do load sharing among them? Or do you just sort of roughly guess and say, well, that's sort of an underserved area or an underserved thing. We'll put something there because latency is so high and you, you hope that things will work right. based upon routing protocols and the like. So. It, it would be interesting to see how you do your test bed. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think I'm nearly to the point where I could actually use actual AnyCast servers in in the test bed. But um, certainly, it's it's easy to um, you know say change the distribution of TTLs or round trip times. Um, okay. That'd be interesting.